colleagues and friends of the International Society of Hypertension, I am Alta Skitte, President of the Society, and it's a great pleasure for me to welcome you all to this online webinar of the International Society of Hypertension as we are releasing the 2020 ISH Global Hypertension Practice Guidelines today. This webinar will be freely available online on the website of the ISH, which is www.ish-world.com as a single downloadable webinar or also as separate links to the different chapters of the webinar. In two weeks time, which is on the 20th of May, we will also give you the opportunity to, to uh, submit any questions to us, which we will address during that session. So uh, from today onwards, you are welcome to post your questions to us through our secretariat's email address. And uh, we will gladly discuss those with you. We welcome any comments and uh, questions you may have. So today, the 6th of May, the guidelines are released online by the two journals, the Journal of Hypertension and uh, Hypertension. And these guidelines are open access and freely available to all. So please make sure to get your copy and uh, submit to us any questions you may have. So without any further ado, here with we start with our online webinar and uh, all the different sections will be presented by different speakers. So welcome. Recently, we have seen the release of several prominent set of guidelines for the management of hypertension around the world. It started in 2017 when the American guidelines were released, followed by the European guidelines in 2018, and those from the United Kingdom released in 2019. Also, the Japanese guidelines were released in 2019. One could easily ask why yet another set of hypertension guidelines are required at this stage. But let's look at this world map of H standardized mean systolic blood pressures, showing low to high blood pressures from blue and purple to orange and red. It is quite striking to see that uh, the countries that released guidelines recently are also the countries with the lowest blood pressures around the world. These are typically also clearly high income regions. When looking at the rest of the global map, it is clear that those in green, yellow and red, orange, are typically lower middle income countries and regions that are less affluent and with lower resources available. These countries typically adopt the guidelines from higher income countries since there's no resources or limited resources to develop own guidelines. Although this is often the only choice available, uh, the, glo the global guidelines or the guidelines released from high income countries are not necessarily fit for global purpose as they rely on regions where there are availability of medication, uh, great infrastructure, as well as a high volume of healthcare workers available to actually manage hypertension. And these are typically not the case in the low resource settings. It should also be taken into account that the global burden of hypertension is, is quite distorted and that the high income regions carry a much lower burden of the global, global uh, prevalence of hypertension. Over 1 billion uh, people with hypertension reside in low and income countries, typically the regions that have um, less resources to manage hypertension. So to address this discrepancy and to align with the mission of the International Society of Hypertension, namely to reduce the global burden of raised blood pressure, we developed the ISH 2020 Global Hypertension Practice Guidelines for Adults. We extracted evidence-based content from recently published guidelines and tailored both essential and optimal standards of care. Essential standards of care refer to minimum standards and every effort should be made to achieve essential standards of care in order to reduce the global burden of hypertension and deaths and disabilities based on hypertension. Optimal standards of care refer to evidence-based standards, and these are typically articulated in uh, guidelines that were released recently. Th throughout this presentation and throughout the guidelines, 
essential and optimal standards of care will be shown in, in these green and blue text in figures and tables throughout. So to, to take this together, the ISH 2020 Global Hypertension Practice Guidelines with us developed based on evidence criteria to be used globally, to be fit for application in low resource and high resource settings by advising on essential and optimal standards of care, and to be concise, simplified and easy to use by clinicians, nurses and community health workers as appropriate. My name is Thomas Unger. I'm an emeritus professor of Maastricht University in the Netherlands, in Europe. And uh, I was the chair, or I'm, I'm still the chair, of the ISH Hypertension Guidelines Committee. Today, I would like to show you a little bit uh, how we got together, and uh, I will tell you something about the process of writing. You have certainly already heard from our president, Alta Schutte, that these new ISH global hypertension guidelines are different from others, from the clinical guidelines that have been published in recent years by the Europeans, by the Americans, and Japanese and around the world. Most guidelines are very complex, and they are written by experts in the field but rather for affluent countries. And what we thought our job should be to write something not only for the affluent regions or settings in the world, but global guidelines that could also be used by less affluent or middle and low income countries and regions. So these new guidelines therefore address the topic in a different way. And you will see how we did that. In the beginning, when um, the president, Alta Schutte, asked me two years ago, almost two years ago, uh, well, would you be willing to chair these guidelines? I thought, well, yes, of course, I do that. But there was also a lot of skepticism that was met. For instance, is it really necessary at all to write new guidelines? We have so many in this world. Is this not a hyper-simplistic view that we uh, want uh, to do them? Is it strictly evidence-based, like the European, the American guidelines, who have dug out a lot of evidence from the literature? And is it helpful for low-income settings and not for the affluent areas of the world? But then we, overcame, we overcome this, um, overcame these uh, problems and uh, we set out for um, our writing procedures. And we had a first meeting, as you can see, in London, in the UK, in February 19, which was followed by further meetings in Paris, in Frankfurt, Germany, and in Glasgow, in the UK, up to the 26th of February this year. And you also see the committee members. They were selected from the, um, from the Council of the ISH, while um, uh, thinking of those people who had already experience in writing uh, guidelines, but also clinical experience and theoretical experience and epidemiology and so on. So these 13 people that you see here were selected to be the committee of the guideline, guideline um, attempt. Well, first of all, of course, we had to define our goals. And what we really wanted was not to review the current evidence again, because this has been done by ACC, AHA, the American guidelines, by the European guidelines, and other colleagues around the world. We wanted to develop a balanced, practical, and realistic, and also feasible, hands-on proposal for global use in line with the mission of ISH, which is, of course, a global society. Global use, that was uh, our option. So we had to uh, stick, of course, to recent guidelines because they gave us the background of evidence. But then we defined something very special, as you can see in green essential and in blue optimal criteria of diagnosis and treatment according to resources availability in low and middle income versus high income settings. I say settings, not not countries, because you may have low and middle income settings also in affluent countries and vice versa. Uh, 
So we had to address, of course, practical questions and always under the idea of essential and optimal. Essential, what is the minimal requirements in countries, in regions, in settings which are not that affluent and optimal just for the more affluent ones, let's say in Europe, America, Japan or so. So you can see the whole list. I'm not going into all these details, but we really made an effort to cover all the fields of hypertension that are relevant to these guidelines. And so we um, ended up with the contents of our guidelines in sections, as you can see, from 1 to 12. So we defined hypertension and we went down through all those fa facets and aspects of hypertension that you can think of or let's say most of them, of course, um, with these 12 sections. The review process uh, was twofold. First of all, we had an internal review. So each section reviewed by another member of the guideline committee. And then, most importantly, we also had an external review, two rounds with 24 experts around the world with special consideration of colleagues from the low and middle income countries. And you can see that. So that goes from Sudan over Russia, Mozambique, Cameroon, Singapore, and some European countries, American countries, Indonesia, Australia, China, Japan, and so on. So we really tried with these 24 reviewers in two rounds to cover the world and to fulfill our global mission in these guidelines. The publication schedule, as you can see here, on May 6, we have the online uh, publication in the Journal of Hypertension and concomitantly in the hypertension, the journal hypertension and hypertension. So two journals will publish online at the same time. On the same day, which is today when you see this webinar, uh, we have the first webinar, the global one, and there will also be initiated by our Chinese friends, a Chinese webinar, which will be in English and also partly in Chinese. On May 20, we expect to have a second webinar with questions and answers that come from your side. So if we receive a lot of questions, which we hope, then we can do the second webinar and answer online these questions that you may have. We also go for internet and social media, of course. We put our guidelines on the homepage of ISH and eventually we will also have translations into several languages around the world. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Job Sergio. I'm a professor of medicine at the University of Athens in Greece. I will present the ISA's guidelines on the definition, classification and diagnosis of hypertension. Hypertension is defined as office blood pressure equal or higher than 140 millimeters mercury systolic and or 90 millimeters mercury diastolic. We recommend two grades. Grade 1 for systolic 140 to 159 and or diastolic 90 to 99. And grade 2 for blood pressure equal or higher than 160 over 100. Normal blood pressure is lower than 130 over 85. And high normal blood pressure is the range between normal tension and hypertension. As I already said, the threshold for diagnosing hypertension on the basis of office measurements is 140 over 90. We recommend lower thresholds for measurements of blood pressure out of the office. For home and daytime ambulatory blood pressure, the threshold is 135 over 85. For 24-hour average ambulatory blood pressure, 130 over 80 and for nighttime blood pressure 120 over 70. We provide detailed recommendations for office blood pressure measurement as this often is the only method available for diagnosing hypertension. At least two visits are required for making the diagnosis of hypertension in the office. Diagnosis based on a single visit is discussed 
unless blood pressure is too high and there is evidence of cardiovascular disease. Whenever possible and available, the diagnosis should be confirmed by home or ambulatory blood pressure measurements. We provide detailed recommendations for the conditions, setting, body position, and to avoid talking, which is a common and neglected factor increasing office blood pressure. For devices to be used in the office, we recommend electronic upper arm cuff devices, which have been properly validated. Alternatively, calibrated auscultatory devices can be used. The size of the cuff should always fit the individual's arm circumference. At each visit in the office, three measurements of blood pressure should be taken, and the average of the last two should be used. And here is our recommendation for remeasuring blood pressure according to the office levels. If office blood pressure is normal, remeasurement is required within three years, or one year if there are other cardiovascular risk factors. When office blood pressure is in the range of high normal blood pressure or grade one hypertension, then whenever possible, the diagnosis should be confirmed with out of office measurements of blood pressure. Alternatively, multiple blood pressure measurements should be confirmed in repeated visits in the office. If office blood pressure suggests grade two hypertension, then this should be confirmed within a few days or weeks. And this is our optimal recommendations where measurement of blood pressure in both arms is required at the initial evaluation and our measurement of standing blood pressure in those patients under treatment who have symptoms suggesting postural hypertension. Unattended automated office blood pressure measurement provides a more standardized evaluation. However, the diagnosis of hypertension based on such measurements has a lower and rather uncertain threshold. We give details for using home and ambulatory blood pressure monitoring on the conditions, the devices, the protocol, and the interpretation. You can see the details for using these methods here. Although these methods are not widely available in all settings, it is important to simplify and promote their wide application because these are often necessary for accurate diagnosis. For confirmed white cord hypertension, drug treatment is recommended only if the total cardiovascular risk is high or there is evidence of organ damage. Otherwise, patients should be followed with lifestyle changes. In confirmed mass hypertension, drug treatment may be considered aiming to normalize out-of-office blood pressure. Thank you. My name is Professor Marcus Schleich. I'm the doctor chair in clinical research at the University of Western Australia and the Royal Perth Hospital in Perth, Australia. And I'm the treasurer of the International Society of Hypertension. I will cover diagnosis and clinical testing. Patients with hypertension are often asymptomatic. However, specific symptoms can suggest secondary forms of hypertension or hypertensive complications that require further investigations. A complete medical and family history is recommended and should include assessment of blood pressure, a history of onset of hypertension, duration, uh, current and previous antihypertensive medications. Risk factors and comorbidities are also important to explore, as are signs and symptoms of secondary hypertension. A thorough physical examination can assist with confirming the diagnosis of hypertension and the identification of hypertension-mediated organ damage and secondary forms of hypertension. It should include an assessment of the circulatory system, the heart, and other organ systems, specifically the kidneys. 
certain lab investigations are very useful to explore other factors that can uh, contribute to hypertension, specifically <clears throat> electrolyte creatinine to assess renal function in form of EGFR, a simple dipstick test to screen for proteinuria, and where available, lipid and fasting glucose levels to look into hypercholesterolemia and diabetes. A 12 lead ECG is very useful to exclude atrial fibrillation and explore whether left ventricular hypertrophy or ischemic heart disease may be present. Under optimal circumstances, additional tests can be considered and usually include extended biochemistry, specifically to look for secondary forms of hypertension and imaging of target organs such as the heart, the kidneys, the brain, and the peripheral vasculature. Fundoscopy is specifically relevant in the context of hypertensive urgencies and emergencies. Cardiovascular risk factors is another aspect that is important to assess since more than 50% of hypertensive patients have additional cardiovascular risk factors. These are most commonly obesity in form of the metabolic syndrome, type 2, diabetes, lipid disorders, and elevated uric acid levels. It is therefore recommended that cardiovascular risk assessment should be performed in all patients with hypertension. We should also consider an increased risk with uh, other entities, in particular chronic inflammatory diseases, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, psychiatric disorders, and psychosocial stresses. Assessing overall cardiovascular risk these days can be done quite elegantly with cardiovascular risk calculators as highlighted here, which takes into account not only the level of blood pressure at any given time, but also the type and the number of additional risk factors, which then based on these calculators give you a low, a moderate and high cardiovascular risk, which is useful for the management of elevated blood pressure. This leads us to hypertension mediated organ damage, which again is an important aspect for the diagnosis and management of hypertension. It is defined as the structural or functional alteration of the arterial vasculature or the organs it supplies caused by elevated blood pressure. The assessment of hypertension mediated organ damage can provide important therapeutic guidance, specifically in two circumstances. If management for hypertensive patients with low or moderate overall risk can change to reclassification uh, by demonstrating the presence of uh, HMOT and preferential selection of drug treatment may be based on the specific impact on hypertension-mediated organ damage. In, as an essential standard in terms of assessment of the hypertension-mediated organ damage, we would recommend to look at serum creatinine and estimated GFR, a test for protein in the urine, uh, usually dipstick, and a 12 lead ECG. Under optimal circumstances, depending on the availability, additional imaging in particular of target organs, such as the brain, the eyes, the heart, the kidneys, and the peripheral arteries can be useful. And certain data suggests that serial assessment of hypertension mediated organ damage may help to determine the efficacy of treatment. Hi everyone, my name is uh, Fadi Chacher. I'm the Professor of Cardiovascular Genomics at Federation University of Australia. I'm also the Vice President of the International Society of Hypertension. Um, I would like to speak to you about the uh, ISH 2020 Global um, Guidelines, in particular the non-pharmacological treatment that we recommend in these new guidelines. Um, in, these, in, in, in these new guidelines, a lifestyle modification are actually recommended as a first line of our antihypertensive treatment uh, and for the prevention of hypertension. This is for patients with grade 1 hypertension, 
And for grade two and patients with a hypertension mediate organ damage, we recommend uh, immediate drug treatment in addition to lifestyle modification. And why have we chosen lifestyle modification as the first line of treatment? Um, and our evidence comes from uh, lots of studies uh, over many years that show that he healthy lifestyle choices can prevent or delay the onset of high blood pressure and can reduce uh, cardiovascular risk. In addition to this, uh, many studies show that modifications in lifestyle can actually enhance the effect of antihypertensive treatments. So what are, are these uh, guidelines that we are recommending? Uh, firstly, I'll start off by talking about diet. Um, uh, we are, the, our first recommendation is actually reduction in salt uh, when preparing food and at the table. And we're also recommending new to these guidelines that uh, patients avoid or limit consumption of high salt foods. And this is uh, salt hidden in many processed foods uh, that they may consume. Secondly, we're recommending a diet rich in whole grains, fruits, vegetables, polyunsaturated fats, and dairy products. And such an example of diet is the DASH diet, which has been recently shown to prevent hypertension and reduce blood pressure. Um, in the guidelines, we're also recommending a, a reduction in foods high in sugar, saturated fats, and trans fat. But we're also recommending the increased intakes of vegetables, which are high in nitrates, uh, such vegetables are leafy green vegetables and beetroot. Uh, there's been many studies now showing that beetroot has beneficial effect in the reduction of uh, blood pressure. Um, other beneficial foods we're, we're recommending are those high in magnesium, calcium, and potassium. Such uh, foods are avocados, nuts, seeds, uh, legumes, and tofu. Um, in terms of diet, we're also recommending the moderate consumption of healthy drinks, and these healthy drinks can be coffee, green and black tea. Uh, there's evidence showing uh, herbal teas such as hibiscus is very beneficial uh, for the reduction of blood pressure. Um, other juices such as pomegranate, beetroot, and cocoa for um, uh, chocolate lovers are also beneficial for blood pressure reduction. In, in, in 2020 guidelines, uh, we recommend moderate consumption of alcohol, and by this we mean uh, two units for men per day, uh, two uh, standard drinks for men per day, or 1.5 standard drinks uh, for women. And in addition to that, we're recommending the avoidance of binge drinking, which has been uh, shown to be uh, detrimental to blood pressure reduction. Um, furthermore, we uh, recommend weight control uh, and avoidance of obesity. Um, and, and for this, we follow uh, the recommended BMI uh, guidelines for different ethnicities. And if not, we recommend a waist to height ratio of four, less than 0.5 for all populations. And we're asking uh, these patients and health professionals to be careful with complementary alternative or traditional medicines where there's little or no evidence that they have any benefit or no reduction of blood pressure. In terms of lifestyle changes, uh, in, in these guidelines, we, we recommend smoking cessation for its uh, obvious benefits for many diseases. Um, also, we, in terms of exercise here, we're recommending the engagement of regular moderate intensity aerobic and resistant exercise new to these guidelines at 30 minutes at five to seven days per week or for those patients that are uh, time poor we're recommending a new form of high intensity interval training uh, which has also sh shown to be beneficial in the reduction of blood pressure furthermore we're uh, uh, we're recommending reduction in stress and the introduction of mindfulness in daily routines and we believe these are areas that are, uh, there's uh, lots of emerging evidence that they're beneficial for blood pressure reduction. And lastly, we uh, recommend uh, a reduction of exposure to air pollution if possible and to cold temperatures. Thank you. Hello, my name is Neil Poulter. I'm Chair of Preventive Cardiovascular Medicine at Imperial College London, and I'm the immediate past president of the International Society of Hypertension. 
uh, and it's my pleasure to introduce uh, the drug treatment of hypertension section of the new 2020 ISH guidelines to you. The first slide shows the uh, thresholds and targets and at the top we'll deal with the thresholds. The story is that once you've got established diagnosis of hypertension, however that is achieved most effectively uh, in your setting, and that lifestyle has um, not normalized the blood pressure, we're left with the two grades of hypertension we've spoken about earlier, grade one and grade two. Now, if you're in grade one and at high risk, either by virtue of your risk factors or because you've got established uh, cardiovascular disease, chronic kidney disease, diabetes, or hypertension-mediated organ damage, uh, we feel that in that level of blood pressure, you should get immediate treatment. Similarly, if you're in grade two, 160 and a, or over 100 and above, uh, whether you're in the optimal or essential setting, once again, we feel you should get immediate drug treatment. The difference comes for those who are at lower risk amongst the grade one population. Now, in an ideal world, the optimal setting, we think that after pushing the lifestyle advice thing, if that still continues not to normalize blood pressure, these people would, should also receive drug treatment. The only really difference here is for those settings where there's limited drug availability in low risk people in the grade one range of blood pressures. And in that setting you may have, because of resources, to uh, ration the drug usage. And we just recommend in that setting, if that's the situation, give it to those uh, at the highest end of this low risk group, perhaps those who are older. Now turning to the um, targets at the bottom of the slide, subdivided by essential and optimal, those in the essential um, setting, we just say try and get the blood pressure down by at least 20 over 10. Ideally moving to less than 140, 90, and that should try to get that done within three months. In the ideal setting, that's stratified by age, if you're under 65, the target is simply less than 130 over 80, if tolerated, but don't go lower than 120, 70. And if you're 65 and above, your target's less than 140, 90, if tolerated. But we have to consider individualized therapy in the context of elderly people, frailty, independence, and tolerability of treatment. The next slide shows the uh, drug choices and sequencing that we're recommending. I'll deal with the optimal ideal setting on the right here in the bluey color. The first thing to stay, say is that we're hoping that we'll be using single pill combinations uh, throughout, if possible. And the reason we do that is our step one is to start with two drugs uh, at low dose in combination. And the combination we've selected for simplicity and perhaps reflecting the results of the accomplished trial too is A plus C. Let me explain. A, this is the system initiated by NICE almost 20 years ago now in UK where A stands for ACE or ARB, so a RAS blocker, plus C, calcium channel blocker. So that's the initial combination we recommend. The footnotes tell us that we may use other combinations for specific settings and ethnicities, but that's our basic uh, go-to combination, A plus C, initiating at low dose. If that's not enough to get you to target, then you get the full dose of that same combination, A plus C, at full dose. If that's not enough, you go to step three, which is A plus C plus D, and the D, the diuretic we've selected, is a thiazide-like diuretic. Now, if after A plus C plus D, you are not controlled, you are by definition resistant, we go on to step four, and we recommend the addition of spironolactone, typical dose range shown there. We've also given some other options, if spironolactone, if the potassium's too high, or it's not tolerated, some other options, but we think spironolactone is probably the best choice to recommend. 
Now, if you're not in the optimal situation, uh, the recommendations for the essential situation are very simple, and that is use whatever drugs are available with as many of the ideal characteristics of antihypertensive agents as possible. And that list of ideal characteristics I'll show in the next slide. We're saying use free combinations if you can't get hold of single pill combinations. And we're saying use thiazide diuretics if thiazide-like diuretics are not available or are too expensive, for example. Finally, comment is to say that uh, use an alternative to the dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers. The C that we spoke about here is dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker. But you can use alternatives to that if they're not tolerated, for example, using diltiazem or verapamil. In both settings, we've added in a rider about beta blockade. They should be continued at, considered at any step if there's a specific indication for their use, such as heart failure, angina, post-MI, atrial fibrillation, etc. The next slide gives you those ideal drug characteristics which we think apply. First of all, treatment should be evidence-based, ideally, uh, in relation to the morbidity and mortality prevention. Secondly, uh, use a once daily regimen, giving 24-hour blood pressure control. Thirdly, treatment should be affordable and or cost-effective relative to other antihypertensive agents. Fourthly, the treatment should be well tolerated. And finally, in an ideal world, we'd have the evidence of benefits of those medications in the populations to which they are to be applied. So to summarize that uh, fairly extensive and key part of the guidelines, here's the first bit of summary. Uh, once the hypertension is established and is uncontrolled by lifestyles, the treatment threshold is 140 and above and 90 and above but at those at the lowest risk with the lowest uh, that could be raised to 160 over 100. As far as the drug treatment targets concerned stratified in the uh, optimal setting if you're under 65 it's 130 80 if you're 65 and above it's 140 90 and in the essential sitting setting just get the blood pressure down by at least 20 over 10. And finally, uh, looking now at the drug treatment in the optimal setting, we say you should up titrate to target, starting with low dose A plus C, that's RAS blocker plus calcium channel blocker, rising to full dose A plus C, going to A plus C plus D. And then that goes on, if that's insufficient, A plus C plus D, add in spinal actone. Now we've given um, the caveat that you may not wish to start, it may be not suitable for certain combinations, certain specific uh, patient subgroups, you may use other initial combinations. We've said if we can use uh, single pill combinations where possible and use thiazide like diuretics preferentially to thiazides. In the essential setting where less ideal agents are available, just focus on getting the effective blood pressure lowering which we've defined as 20 over 10 at least. Thank you for your attention. My name is Claudio Borghi. I'm professor of medicine and I'm working for the University of Bologna. The topic of my presentation would be the hypertension and the common comorbidities. Hypertension is certainly the most important risk factor for cardiovascular disease. But usually, hypertension comes rarely alone without any additional diseases. In most hypertensive patients, we see we have several comorbidities that affect the cardiovascular risk profile and the treatment strategies. It's important because the number of comorbidities in the hypertensive population is increasing with age, with the duration of hypertension, and in particular with the emerging clinical complexity we are going to see every day in our hypertensive patients. Currently, I think that a lot of energy has been spent to treat hypertension to improve the blood pressure control, but the management of the comorbidities is still insufficient, and some of them are not usually treated in the right way. For this reason, 
I think that in a modern approach to hypertension, common and uncommon comorbidities should be identified in the hypertensive patient and they should be managed according to the best available evidence, like any guidelines would suggest. Uh, when we talk about the comorbidities in the hypertensive patient, I think we have to distinguish between the common and the uncommon comorbidities. The common comorbidities are probably those that everybody of us knows, which are directly related to the negative impact of high blood pressure, and there are include coronary artery disease, stroke and cerebrovascular disease in general, chronic kidney disease, heart failure, pulmonary disease, and in some low-income country, the HMV and AIDS infection. On the other side, most important are probably the emerging uncommon comorbidities that are including mainly the rheumatic or the chronic inflammatory diseases and the psychiatric diseases. Uncommon comorbidities are usually underestimated in the general evaluation of the hypertensive patient, are usually underestimated by the available guideline and often they are treated with some prescribed drugs that frequently are going to interfere with the antihypertensive treatment. Oh, let's say to see uh, which are the common comorbidities in the hypertensive patient. I think the most important comorbidities should be treated according to some common and well-known therapeutic strategies that are closely depending on the cardiovascular risk profile of the patient and they are including lifestyle changes, and in particular diet, exercise, body weight, and, and uh, uh, cessation of the smoking. Of course, we have to treat blood pressure in a very effective way, try to achieve the targets which are suggested by any guidelines in patients with hypertension. At the same time, since most of these comorbidities are involving additional risk factors, it's very important that these additional risk factors are treated in the right way. And in particular, in the hypertensive patient, we should manage LDL cholesterol and all the abnormalities of the lipid profile, the glucose profile, and recently, many evidence are supporting the importance of managing serum uric acid. At the same time, since most patients have some kind of atherosclerotic and prothrombotic disease, the antithrombotic treatment seems to be very important in the average treatment of the common comorbidities affecting the hypertensive population. For the uncommon comorbidity, the comorbidities, the situation is pretty much more difficult. The situation is more difficult for the, this kind of comorbidities since for many of them, we don't have any dedicated randomized clinical trial and we have to rely on single population studies or reg registries considering as a main support to recommendation, the characteristic of the patient and the blood pressure lowering drugs and the nature of the concomitant treatment. According to the prevalence of uncommon comorbidities, in these guidelines we have decided to focus on the rheumatic disease and the inflammatory disease in general and on the psychiatric disorders. In terms of treatment of hypertension in patients with rheumatic disease, I think the, the treatment with the renin angiotensin system inhibitors and calcium channel blocker uh, a combination with the diuretics maybe could be the best solution according to the activation of the renin angiotensin system we see in this population of patients. At the same time, I think the biological treatment that are currently used in these patients usually do not affect the blood pressure that can be used in every country where they are available. On the other side, we have to pay a lot of attention to the use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs which are currently used in these patients that can be given to patients with hypertension if they deserve it only at low doses. As far as the treatment of the psychiatric disorders, which seems a very important uh, uh, emerging problem, again, the drug inhibiting the renin angiotensin system and the diuretics seems to be the best solution since they don't interfere with the, uh, let's say, drugs which are currently used for these patients. The beta blocker should be used only in a limited population of patients, in particular avoiding metoprolol, which is able to get into the brain. And they should be uh, considered only in those patients in which the antipsychiatric drug can cause tachycardia. At the same time, lipid lowering drug and anti-diabetic drug for the treatment of the uh, concomitant diseases can be uh, 
uh, deliberately used. In terms of warning, I think it's important to avoid the calcium channel blocker whenever it's possible because they can interfere with the pharmacokinetic of antipsychiatric drugs and they can cause orthostatic hypotension in, combina in combination with antidepressive drugs. So this is a very important topic. I think it's one of the news of these uh, guidelines. And I think what we have to do is try to focus uh, much more on the problem of comorbidities, just try to reduce the overall risk of hypertensive patients. My name is Maciej Tomaszewski. I'm a professor of cardiovascular medicine at the University of Manchester and a consultant physician at the Manchester University NHS Foundation Trust. I'm the president-elect of International Society of Hypertension. Resistant hypertension has its own dedicated section in our guidelines. We have, in essence, retained the previous definitions of this condition. It is um, still defined as office blood pressure elevated over 140 over 90 millimeters mercury in patients who are treated with at least three blood pressure lowering agents in maximal or maximally tolerated doses, including a diuretic. However, we have put a very strong emphasis on the exclusion of pseudo-resistant hypertension and substance-induced hypertension as con contributors to uncontrolled hypertension prior to the diagnosis of resistant hypertension. We have highlighted the four most common um, types of pseudo-resistant hypertension, uh, including white coat effects, non-adherence to antihypertensive anti treatment, incorrect blood pressure measurements, and errors in antihypertensive treatment. And uh, those account for up to 50% of uncontrolled hypertension in patients initially diagnosed with resistant hypertension. In every patient with resistant hypertension, appropriate lifestyle changes need to be undertaken and this optimization of health behavior is an integral part of the management strategy for resistant hypertension. We also put an emphasis on changes in the diuretic-based treatment, treatment prior to adding the fourth line agents Errors in diuretic-based treatment are common in patients with resistant hypertension and, op and uh, optimization of the doses, uh, changes in the types of diuretic or simple adjustment of the either type or dose of diuretic to the EGFR are absolutely essential prior to making any other changes in treatment. Spinalactam is our choice of drug as a fourth line agent, and this is um, indicated in patients whose serum potassium is below 4.5 millimoles per liter and whose EGFR is not severely compromised. We do recommend um, amyloride, doxazosin, eplerinone, clonidine, or beta blockers are suitable alternative to spinalactin in patients in whom spinalactin is either not tolerated or contraindicated. We also appreciate that the, in certain clinical settings, the access to, this, um, to these medications might not be available. And we recommend that any antihypertensive class not already in use is appropriate choice under such circumstances. Finally, we do recommend that resistant hypertension is managed, if feasible, in a center with, with sufficient expertise and resources. Secondary hypertension affects 5 to 10 percent of patients with elevated blood pressure, and we recommend screening for secondary hypertension in patients presenting as and early onset hypertension for those diagnosed with resistant hypertension. We also recommend that secondary hypertension should be considered 
in hypertensive patients who have sudden blood pressure uh, control deterioration or those uh, presenting at the uh, with hypertensive urgencies and emergencies. Finally, um, secondary hypertension should be considered whenever there is a very high clinical probability of this condition and we list the most common clinical situations where we should suspect different types of secondary hypertension. We emphasize the importance of exclusion of pseudo-resistant hypertension and drug or substance-induced hypertension prior to undertaking the expensive and offer invasive investigations for secondary hypertension. We also define a diagnostic minimum for secondary hypertension. We do emphasize um, relying on a very thorough clinical history and physical examination and we list uh, different clinical clues that should direct clinicians to specific types of secondary hypertension. Uh, this clinical um, examination and history should be supplemented by basic blood biochemistry, including serum sodium, potassium, EGFR, TSH, and dipstick urine analysis. This is our diagnostic minimum for secondary hypertension. Uh, the, in, the other investigations for secondary hypertension, such as additional and more sophisticated blood biochemistry imaging, uh, should be selected on, based on specific insights from basic biochemistry, history and physical examination, we recommend personalized approach to the diagnostic workup for secondary hypertension. We also recommend that secondary hypertension is managed in centers with appropriate uh, expertise and resources. Hello, this is Dr. Nadia Khan, and I'm from the University of British Columbia, Canada, and I'm going to be speaking on this segment about exacerbators and inducers of hypertension. In the section in the guideline, we present a table of different medications and substances that are associated with increased blood pressure. And these substances or medications actually can raise blood pressure, they can cause hypertension, or they can antagonize antihypertensive therapy. It is important to note that the effect of these substances or medications varies widely between individuals. So while some medications or substances may have smaller increases in blood pressure, for different individuals, there can be significantly higher rates of blood pressure um, with certain agents. So in the guidelines, we recommend as for optimal and essential, all patients with or at risk for hypertension should be screened for such medications or substances. And if appropriate, um, we can try to reduce or eliminate these substances or medications from a patient to try to help them with their blood pressure. We're just going to review a few common medications that can increase blood pressure and non-selective or traditional NSAIDs are the more common types of NSAIDs that can raise blood pressure. Also the combined oral contraceptive pill and this was mostly seen in contraceptive pills that had a significantly higher amount of estrogen uh, in those combination tablets. And select antidepressants uh, we're familiar with tricyclic antidepressants as well as SNRIs that can increase blood pressure. Now, medications like SSRIs, on the other hand, tend to not increase blood pressure. And there have been multiple studies and meta-analyses that show acetaminophen when used in, uh, for daily dose and for prolonged periods of times at increased doses is associated with increased risk of developing hypertension. Other medications to note would be antiretroviral therapies. And currently the studies are really inconclusive as to whether they demonstrate an increased or nil effect on blood pressure. So it's really inconclusive at this point. 
Alcohol, on the other hand, does conclusively raise blood pressure, and that's regardless of the type of alcoholic drink. So wine, for example, also can raise blood pressure when used at increased or higher amounts. And there are limited evidence on herbal or other substances. So we know that these herbal or other substances can raise blood pressure, uh, but there's really limited studies onto the effects of these specific agents. Ma Huang, ginseng at high doses, and St. John's wort have all been reported to raise blood pressure. Hello, my name is uh, Durai Raj Pakran. I'm a cardiologist and epidemiologist from India. I'm uh, vice, currently Vice President of uh, Research and Policy at the Public Health Foundation of India. I'm going to talk on this important topic of ethnicity, race, and hypertension. So the question how does ethnicity and race uh, impact hypertension? The issue is prevalence, treatment, and control rates vary significantly according to ethnicity. And most people would think that it's because of genetic differences. But there are several other factors that contribute to these differences, which include contextual and cultural practices, particularly in relation to lifestyle and socioeconomic status differences, uh, in terms of uh, healthy behaviors such as uh, healthy diet, uh, moderate alcohol consumption and uh, increased physical activity. The third factor that impacts management of hypertension is the access to health system. How accessible is the health system to people? Is there universal health coverage? Is there insurance for OPD practices? So on and so forth. The last point, of course, is particularly relevant to rural areas and uh, low middle income country settings is availability and distribution of essential drugs. We know that treatment of hypertension is simple, but these drugs should be available and it's not available in all the places at all the time. So let's look at two ethnic differences. The first one is people of African descent. We all know that uh, they have a very high risk for hypertension. And when they have hypertension, uh, there's increased risk for organ damage at much younger ages. They have resistance and nighttime hypertension. There's no nocturnal dipping. See, observed uh, as much as what we see in Caucasian population. There's increased risk of kidney disease, stroke, heart failure, and hypertension-related mortality. So the reasons are used are many, but mostly it is related to physiological uh, differences, particularly the decreased renin angiotensin uh, aldosterone system, altered renal sonia bandling, increased cardiovascular reactivity, and early vascular aging. So what do we do about this, particularly in terms of management of hypertension? The screening is similar. There should be an annual screening for adults uh, more than 18 years. Lifestyle modification should be, avoid, uh, should be advised, particularly in terms of health promotion for people who have uh, not uh, progressed on to prehypertension or hypertension. And the first line pharma pharmacological therapy is, should be a single pill combination, such as a thiazide-like diuretic uh, and a calcium channel blocker or a calcium channel blocker and an angiotensin uh, receptor blocker. Angiotensin receptor blockers are preferred over ACE inhibitors among black patients because there is almost three times higher chances of angioedema with ACE inhibitors. Now, let's look at another ethnic, ethnic population, that is populations from Asia. They are unique in the sense that morning and nighttime hypertension is high as compared to Europeans. And particularly amongst the East Asian uh, population, such as the Japanese, Indonesians, Malaysians, and others, there's increased likelihood of salt sensitivity. In addition to mild obesity in hypertensive patients, there is increased stroke prevalence, especially hemorrhagic stroke and um, non-ischemic uh, heart failure uh, as compared to Western populations. In terms of South Asian populations where I come from, particularly the uh, countries of India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nepal, Bhutan, and others, the so-called Indian subcontinent, there is increased risk for cardiovascular and metabolic diseases, particularly coronary artery disease and type 2 diabetes. Management of hypertension remains the same, standard treatment, until we get more evidence. In fact, we are embarking on a large trial in South Asia to look at um, what are the best drugs uh, for initiation in the management of hypertension. Thank you. Hello, this is Dr. Nadia Khan, and I'm a professor of medicine at the University of British Columbia in Canada. And I'm going to talk to you today about hypertension in pregnancy or hypertensive disorders of pregnancy.
So the hypertensive disorders of pregnancy represent a broad range of conditions, including pre-existing hypertension, gestational hypertension, preeclampsia, eclampsia, and HELP syndrome. And these conditions are actually affecting about 5 to 10% of pregnancies worldwide. And most of the maternal fetal risks associated with them occur also in um, lower middle income countries. And maternal risks include placental abruption, stroke, uh, and they also have women that have had uh, preeclampsia, for example, or hypertensive disorders of pregnancy are at increased risk of developing cardiovascular risk factors, including hypertension and diabetes, and also they have an independently higher risk of developing cardiovascular disease in the future. There are also important fetal and newborn risks, including fetal growth restriction, preterm delivery, increased fetal and neonatal morbidity and mortality. So really these conditions are very, uh, have, have very significant sequelae for both mom and for the newborn. So really it is very important that there is accurate diagnosis of these conditions. So that will start with a appropriate and accurate blood pressure measurement in pregnancy. So uh, as an essential, we've recommended that uh, we use either office manual auscultation or an office automated upper arm blood pressure device. And both of these devices or these kinds of devices really should be validated specifically in pregnancy and preeclampsia. And you can see, for example, on the stridebp.com website, examples of these validated um, devices. And then if possible and if available, it would be optimal to also obtain a 24-hour ambulatory blood pressure monitor and or home blood pressure monitoring. Again, both of these should be validated in pregnancy and the real purpose is to evaluate for white coat hypertension. And when we do investigate women that have hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, it's important to get urinalysis, a complete blood count that would include a hematocrit, liver enzymes, serum, uric acid level, and serum creatinine. Uh, we should test for proteinuria early in pregnancy and again after 20 weeks gestation. And if you have a positive urine dipstick, that should be followed with the spot urine albumin creatinine ratio. And then optimally also obtaining ultrasound of the kidney and Doppler ultrasounds of the uterine arteries. Importantly, um, there are some therapies that can help lower the risk of developing preeclampsia. And those include low dose aspirin started at or after 12 weeks until delivery and oral calcium in those women who have low dietary intake. And these are Agents have been shown to lower the risk of developing preeclampsia and should be offered to women that are at, at high risk or increased risk. And what, what classifies that? So if your first pregnancy, if woman's first pregnancy is over the age of 40, uh, pregnancy interval more than 10 years since their last pregnancy, if they have issues with obesity, uh, they have multiple pregnancy like twin delivery, twin birth or twin pregnancy, chronic hypertension, diabetes, chronic kidney disease, autoimmune disease like lupus, uh, hypertension in a previous pregnancy, or even a family history of preeclampsia, these women would be good candidates to starting on uh, preeclampsia prophylaxis. And how do you manage hypertension in pregnancy? So really, it's important to initiate antihypertensive therapy in all women if their blood pressure is persistently above 150 over 95 and then certainly at a lower threshold greater than 140 over 90 if women have gestational hypertension or they have subclinical hypertension mediated organ damage and those first line drug options typically include drugs like labetalol or mefalodopa or a dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker if women's blood pressures are very high, for example, greater than or equal to 170 over 110, we would recommend immediately hospitalizing um, these patients and starting on IV antihypertensive therapy. And the most 
commonly used one is IV labetalol, but there certainly are alternatives that can be used, like IV hydralazine, for example, or oral methylodopa is also an alternate, or oral dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers. And then starting IV magnesium, and also if the woman develops pulmonary hypertension, pulmonary edema, then IV nitroglycerin. Regarding delivery in gestational hypertension or preeclampsia, we would recommend that um, women uh, have delivery at 37 weeks if asymptomatic. And then, of course, delivery would have to be expedited in women with preeclampsia with visual disturbances or hemostatic disorders or if they develop HELP syndrome. Now, postpartum after delivery, um, it's important to continue that lifestyle modification and health behavior change to really try to reduce the risk of ongoing cardiovascular risk, as these women certainly are at heightened risk for developing multiple cardiovascular risk factors. So essential would be to continue with lifestyle optimization and then an optimal, um, if possible, also annual blood pressure checks, as these women also have a significantly increased risk of developing hypertension. And Really importantly, hypertensive emergencies are defined as severely elevated blood pressure that's associated with acute hypertension-mediated organ damage. So really emphasize on acute uh, changes in organ damage. And that typically requires immediate blood pressure lowering and typically with IV antihypertensive therapy. Um, other is the hypertensive urgency, which is, again, severely elevated blood pressure, but without acute hypertension-mediated organ damage or target organ damage. And this can be managed uh, with oral antihypertensive agents. So when you have a patient with severely elevated blood pressure, it is critical that they have an immediate evaluation for the presence of hypertension-mediated organ damage, and that would include a fundoscopic exam and really looking for signs and symptoms of stroke, heart failure, cardiac ischemia, uh, dissection, for example. And the investigations that should be done immediately would include a hemoglobin, platelets, creatinine, sodium, potassium, a lactate dehydrogenase, haptoglobin, urine, um, protein assessment, um, and an EKG. If available, and it would be considered optimal, it would be specific tests given their uh, presentation. So if they have chest pain or an anginal equivalent, it would be important to do cardiac enzymes like troponin levels. If they have evidence of heart failure, then chest x-ray. And if concerned about dissection, transesophageal echocardiogram, CT or, or MRI brain imaging for cerebral hemorrhage or stroke or ischemic stroke, and CT angiography of the thorax and abdomen also for aer acute aortic disease, including dissection. The management is, uh, if for a hypertensive emergency, again, requires immediate blood pressure lowering. And really, the principle is to prevent any further hypertension-mediated organ damage. There is, unfortunately, very little data to guide what types of agents and what time uh, we should be starting these agents and also the degree that which we should lower blood pressure to. So it does in, depend on the clinical context. IV labetalol and nicardipine are generally safe to use in all hypertensive emergencies. And we have in the guideline listed out, and I won't go through these in this table, but the different clinical scenarios and then the recommended time to start uh, IV antihypertensive therapy or oral hypertensive therapy, and as well, um, which agents are optimal in these certain specific clinical circumstances. Um, my name is um, Brian Williams. I'm chair of medicine at UCL in London, uh, and I was also chair of the uh, European Hypertension Guidelines and uh, a member of the Guideline Committee for the International Society of Hypertension Guidelines. And what I'm going to do now is really review the differences and similarities between these two guidelines in Europe and internationally. This slide shows the comparison between 
the two guidelines. And let's focus first on the target population. The focus of the European guideline, and indeed both guidelines, is on optimal care when possible. However, an important distinction of the international guideline is the recognition that optimal care will not always be possible in low resource settings or in settings where there is no comprehensive healthcare cover. And so the guideline has speci uh, specified essential care requirements. Now the classification of blood pressure is based on office blood pressure in both guidelines as it is around the world. And this is based on a diagnosis of hypertension when blood pressure is more than 140 over 90. The diagnosis of hypertension is similar in both guidelines for optimal care. And that is, screening would be based on office blood pressure, and if blood pressure is elevated, the, the elevation in blood pressure and diagnosis of hypertension should be confirmed by ADPM, home blood pressure, or repeated office blood pressure measurements. Now, the essential requirement for low resource settings in the ISH guideline is to use office blood pressure throughout to uh, both diagnose and monitor uh, blood pressure with the use of ADPM or home blood pressure, if possible, in these settings to confirm the diagnosis of hypertension. Cardiovascular risk assessment forms an important part of the management of hypertension, and both guidelines for, recommend the use of a cardiovascular risk assessment tool to aid the assessment of risk. In Europe, the SCORE program is specified for risk assessment, whereas in the international guideline, risk assessment can be based on any available risk assessment tool according to different regions of the world. Now, in terms of drug treatment, this is recommended along with lifestyle intervention in both guidelines when there is grade two hypertension or when there is grade one hypertension and high risk categorization, usually due to the presence of comorbid diseases or target organ damage. These patients should receive immediate treatment and lifestyle intervention. In the optimal care group in both guidelines, grade one hypertension at low risk should be monitored with lifestyle intervention for three to six months and then treatment initiated if blood pressure isn't controlled. And this is the same for both guidelines. In terms of the ISH guideline, they also specify that in essential care settings, in other words, in low resource settings, where this may not be possible, the focus should be on ensuring people with grade two hypertension are treated or high risk grade one if the resources are limited. <clears throat> now lifestyle intervention differs very little in any guideline across the world. All of these guidelines emphasize its importance to complement treatment or try and delay treatment in people with borderline hypertension and reduce risk. And all of the guidelines recommend similar interventions. In the ISH guideline, there is one or two additional interventions for optimal care, and they are uh, avoiding stress reduction and indeed avoiding air pollution, the latter potentially being very important in certain settings. Now, in terms of drug treatment, um, both guidelines for optimal care recommend initiating therapy in most patients with two drugs, ideally as a single pill combination. As the combinations in Europe are either an ACE or an ARB with a CCB or diuretic, and in the optimal care arm of the ISH guideline, the combination preferred is an ACE or an ARB with a CCB, or indeed the option of using a CCB and a diuretic in people of black African origin. Uh, in the essential arm of the ISH treatment guideline, it's recognized that all of these drugs may not be available as prescribed for optimal care, and that the recommendation is if they're not available, any drug that has been shown to safely lower blood pressure should be considered to achieve that objective. Now, in terms of further drug treatment for people who do not respond to treatment with initial therapy with two drugs, um, the guidelines are quite similar, recommending a ACE or an ARB with a CCB and diuretic as a combination, ideally as a single pill combination for optimal care if available, and then adding further diuretic, usually spironolactone or other drugs in patients with four drug requirement, i.e. resistant hypertension. And once again, for the ISH guideline, the essential component is to ensure that people are treated with any available drug 
if those optimal treatment options are not available to use. Now finally I turn to treatment targets. This is an important area and both guidelines recommend lowering blood pressure below 140 over 90 as the initial objective and then aiming to get blood pressure down to 130 over 80 or lower. In the European guideline, they recommend considering going lower than 130 over 80 in younger patients who will tolerate a lower blood pressure and down to 130 over 80 in older patients if they tolerate that level of pressure. In the international guideline, they recommend getting down to 130 over 80 as optimal care or lower um, in all patients Again, individualizing treatment as necessary in older patients because they may not tolerate these low levels of pressure. And in terms of the essential recommendation in the ISH guideline, it's to reduce blood pressure by at least 20 millimeters of mercury if possible, and aim in all patients if possible to get blood pressure below 140 over 90, again, based on considerations of tolerability and frailty. Both guidelines emphasize the importance of monitoring therapy, following up patients, trying to ensure blood pressure is controlled quickly within three months, and monitoring for side effects of therapy, particularly with these lower targets, and checking adherence to ensure blood pressure is controlled, particularly in patients where blood pressure control is not optimal. And that's the same for both guidelines. Finally, the European guideline places a great emphasis on recommendations around uh, concomitant drug treatment for risk management, notably the delivery of statins to all patients at high or very high risk and consideration of statins for patients even at low to moderate risk with hypertension and the use of antiplatelet therapy, usually aspirin in low dose for those for secondary prevention. The actual guideline from the international guideline doesn't contain a specific recommendation on concomitant cardiovascular disease risk management, but surely uh, would indeed uh, endorse the recommendations of many other guidelines in this area as well. Thank you very much for your attention. It is a pleasure to be here today talking to you about the International Society of Hypertension Global Guidelines 2020. Um, my role on this is to talk to you about the differences between the current ISH guidelines and the ACC AHA guidelines that were last released in 2017. My name is Richard Wainford. I am an Associate Professor of Medicine at the Boston University School of Medicine. I'm in the Department of Pharmacology and Experimental Therapeutics, the Whitaker Cardiovascular Institute, and Sargent College. Overall, broadly speaking, there are more similarities than there are differences between the International Society of Hypertension 2020 guidelines and the ACC AHA guidelines. The multiple points of agree agreement include using a combination of approaches to measure blood pressure, combining office and out of office blood pressure, and where or if possible, the use of ambulatory blood pressure recording. Additionally, the treatment guidelines for both lifestyle and pharmacological approaches to treat hypertension are broadly similar across the ACC and the ISH guidelines. However, there are substantial or sudden differences between these guidelines. As you can see here illustrated on this slide, the major differences between these two guidelines relate to how blood pressure is classified. Primarily, the major differences are between the definition of what is constituted as a normal blood pressure and the different stages of hypertension. In the International Society of Hypertension Guidelines, we have the inclusion of a blood pressure category that is not present in the ACC AHA guidelines, the high normal blood pressure category. Additionally, we have different blood pressure threshold values for different stages of hypertension, and this corresponds into different treatment thresholds for hypertension. As shown here on this slide, treatment is initiated at lower blood pressure values in the ACC AHA guidelines versus the International Society of Hypertension Guidelines. Another major difference between the ISH and the ACC AHA guidelines is related to the use of the essential versus optimal approaches throughout the ISH guidelines. This has been introduced in the ISH guidelines to try and meet the goal of accounting for disparities in access to resources to treat hypertension globally, and ideally try and provide a proposal that is suitable for global use in multiple communities and resource settings for both clinicians, nurses, and healthcare providers.
As shown on this slide with blood pressure value illustrated, the major differences between the two guidelines are shown here. As shown on the top left, the normal blood pressure in the International Society of Hypertension Guidelines is defined as a systolic blood pressure lower than 130 millimeters of mercury and a diastolic pressure below 85 millimeters of mercury. These values are higher than the normal values used in the AHA ACC guidelines shown in the lower table. Instead of using the term elevated that is included in the AHA ACC guidelines, the ISH guidelines use the term high normal blood pressure. And in the ISH guidelines, this is referred to as systolic blood pressure between 130 and 139 millimeters of mercury and or diastolic blood pressure of 85 to 89 millimeters of mercury. The major difference between the two guidelines is shown in the next line when we talk about hypertension. Grade one hypertension in the International Society of Hypertension Guidelines is defined as a systolic blood pressure between of 140 to 159 millimeters of mercury and or a diastolic blood pressure of 90 to 99 millimeters of mercury. This is different than the AHA guidelines and this has implications for the initiation of treatment in hypertensive patients. And finally, as you can see on this slide, the definition of stage or grade two hypertension differs between the ISH and the AHA guidelines, with higher blood pressure thresholds being used to define grade two hypertension in the International Society of Hypertension guidelines. I am Hiroshi Ito, the president of Japanese Society of Hypertension, JSH. Today, I will explain the comparison of ISH and JSH guidelines. This is a blood pressure classification. Office blood pressure more than 140 over 90 millimeter mercury is a criterion of hypertension in JSH 2019, which is the same in ISH 2020. Normal blood pressure below 120 over 80 millimeter mercury. This is in contrast to ISH 2020 below 130 over 85 millimeter mercury. JSH 2019 has a category of elevated blood pressure, which implies a disease state required for intervention. JSH 2019 shows a criteria of both office and home blood pressure with equal values for blood pressure classification. This shows the risk stratification. Elevated blood pressure in JSH 2019 is regarded as having high risk when it is complicated with cardiovascular disease, diabetes, CKD with proteinuria, non valvular atrial fibrillation, or more than three risk factors. That is the case with high normal blood pressure in ISH 2020. It can be high risk if it is complicated with hypertension mediated organ damage, CKD grade three, diabetes mellitus, or cardiovascular disease. This is blood pressure measurement plan according to office blood pressure levels. In patients with elevated blood pressure, pharmacological therapy can be initiated when cardiovascular risk is high and blood pressure control is insufficient with non-pharmacological therapy. That is the case with high normal blood pressure in ISH 2020 and 2018 ESC ESH guidelines, which indicate that drug treatment should be considered if cardiovascular risk is very high. This is a diagnosis of hypertension. In ISH 2020, the diagnosis of hypertension is made by repeated office blood pressure, but not by home blood pressure. In JSH 2019, the diagnosis of hypertension is made by office blood pressure and home blood pressure. When an office blood pressure-based diagnosis differs from a home blood pressure-based diagnosis, the latter is prioritized. This is a target blood pressure control. In ISH 2020, the blood pressure target differs at the age of 65 years, but in JSH 2019, at 75 years. In JSH 2019, blood pressure patients with cardiovascular disease coronary artery disease, diabetes, CKD with proteinuria or on anti-thrombotic drugs should be lowered to below 130 over 80 millimeter mercury, even if in the age of over 75 years. In ISH 2020, the lower limit, that is 120 over 70 is shown. JSS 2019 calls attention against excessive blood pressure lowering. 
This is lifestyle modifications. JSH 2019 gives concrete values to the goals. ISH 2020 gives additional goals. This is the drug treatment strategy. As first line, JSH recommends monotherapy, whereas ISH 2020 recommends combination therapy using combination tablet. In JSH 2019, Cyadyl diuretics are included in first-line drugs. JSH 2019 does not mention triple combination using a single pill. In JSH 2019, beta and alpha brokers are equally recommended as MR antagonists at step four. That is all. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm uh, Ramirez Agustin, present president of the Latin American Society of uh, Hypertension, and I'm going to spend a few words uh, on the similarities and these uh, differences between uh, both guidelines. So to start, I would like to mention a common burden in Latin America that are growing global uh, morbidity and premature mortality associated with non-communicable diseases, and the financial constraints and inefficiencies found in the healthcare models in Latin America. I would like also to focus our attention in lifestyle changes, especially related to physical activity and healthy diet, especially in children, and the cybernetic activities they are involved on in these last years. All uh, this point uh, make uh, uh, favor the growing of cardiovascular risk factors, especially obesity, dyspidemia, hypertension, and consequently metabolic syndrome with high prevalence in Latin America. However, in general, we can say that reading both guidelines uh, uh, there is more congruence than discrepancies that uh, were found. Relating the points to be discussed on diagnosis and use of office and out of office blood pressure measurement, uh, all those points agree in both uh, uh, guidelines. Uh, when we move to the blood pressure uh, values, the main uh, uh, similarities uh, between both guidelines is the fact that the cutoff of blood pressure is 140 90 millimeter of mercury to differentiate uh, normal tension from uh, arterial hypertension. And in the field of hypertension, there is a similarity between the grade one uh, identification of hypertension in both guidelines, why in the International Society of Hypertension, grade two involves the grade two and three of the Latin American Society of Hypertension. In the table of the guidelines of the Latin American Society is present isolated systolic hypertension, not shown in the table of the International Society of Hypertension. However, this point was presented and discussed in the text. Relating normal tension, there is a coincidence in the high normal qualification of normal tension, while in the International Society of Hypertension, all values lower than 130, 85 millimeter of mercury are considered normal when in this range, the Latin American society has two different qualification as normal and uh, optimal uh, blood pressure values. Uh, relating the non-pharmacological treatment, uh, despite the difference in the usual daily diet in Latin, in Latin America, we can found in different countries, we agree in both guidelines uh, that the benefits of uh, lifestyle changes to the general population is uh, uh, of great interest on the common and other comorbidities due to the prevalence of specific pathology, pathologies as mentioned in the first slide. The Latin American emphasized specifically in the 
the specific diagnosis and treatment of malnutrition, especially in children and adolescents. And finally, relating the ethnic population, in addition to Afro-descendants, the Latino American guidelines introduced directive for people living in on high altitude in the Andes mountain range. Thank you very much for your attention. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the last section of our hypertension guidelines, and it's called hypertension management at a glance. It's basically only two slides, uh, two pictures. On these pictures, you will find a compilation of what we have done in terms of essential and optimal diagnosis management of hypertension. Let me just start uh, with the green one, which is essential, as you may have learned so far. And it's uh, built in uh, four parts, diagnosis, evaluation, treatment, and monitoring. And when we come to the blue one, to the optimal on the next slide, it will be exactly the same diagnosis, evaluation, treatment, and monitoring. Right, let's start with this one, diagnosis. How is it done in essentially in essential conditions? That is where not everything is available and where the facilities and possibilities are much less uh, exuberant than in the uh, affluent regions or countries. So we start with single office blood pressure measurement, a single office blood pressure measurement. And then we divide uh, the measurements in three, as you can see. Normal blood pressure level is if blood pressure systolic is below 130, diastolic below 85. So in this case, you just remeasure after three years and one year in those which other risk factors. Then we come to the second one where we divide it into high normal blood pressure levels and hypertension blood pressure. High normal means that there are systolic between 130 to 139 and diastolic between 80 and 89. In this case, you have to take two more readings and use the average of the second and the third. Now, hypertension means that these patients have blood pressures above 140 over 90 millimeters of mercury. And in this case, you also have to take two more readings and use the average of the second and the third. If then blood pressure is still above or equals 130 over 85, we advise you to remeasure in two or three more office visits, if at all possible. And if possible, confirm with home or ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. If then blood pressure is above 140 or equals 140 over 90 and is above 140 over 90, then this indicates hypertension, particularly if whole blood pressure is above 135, 85, or 24 ambulatory blood pressure above 130 um, over 80 millimeters of mercury. Then the diagnosis is established. The evaluation you will see is very similar in the green and in the blue area, in uh, essential and in optimal. So what is essential, you have to take, of course, a history and do a physical exam. So you have to exclude drug-induced hypertension. You have to evaluate for organ damage, assess total cardiovascular risk, search for symptoms and signs of secondary hypertension. Lab tests, again, you will see very similar, even identical. You have to do serum sodium, potassium, and creatinine. Lipid profile and glucose, if at all possible. Sometimes it's not, I agree. You have to try urine dipstick and do a 12-lead ECG. And additional tests then, if necessary, for you have to look for organ damage or for other signs of hypertension, secondary hypertension. Right, then we come to the treatment area, starting again here on the green um, screen with the treatment in uh, essential conditions. We divide, as you can see, grade one and grade two hypertension. Grade three is not there in our guidelines anymore. Grade one is, as we have already said, above 140 to 159 systolic and above 90 to 99 uh, diastolic. So what you have to do always to start with lifestyle interventions, 
we come to that. The second point, you have to start drug treatment in special groups if you want. High-risk patients with cardiovascular disease, chronic kidney disease, diabetes, organ damage, or importantly, aged between 50 and 80 years. So the elderly patients. All others with persistent blood pressure elevation after three to six months of lifestyle intervention, you have to also start with drug treatment. In grade two hypertension, that is when blood pressure is equal or above 160 over 100 millimeters of mercury, you always have to start treatment with drugs immediately. And of course, this should be accompanied by lifestyle intervention. So far, so good. Now, what are these lifestyle interventions? It's, of course, stop smoking, we all know that, regular exercise, lose weight, salt reduction, healthy diet and drinks, if possible at all, and of course, also lower alcohol intake if this is a problem. The drug therapy steps um, start um, slightly different or maybe quite different from the blue optimal area that we find on the next slide. We use any drug available and include as many of those below mentioned drugs as possible. So if you, are, you don't have access to any of those drugs um, that are recommended, please use any drug available to lower blood pressure. Because in this case, it's more important to lower blood pressure at all than to use a specific drug to do that. Consider monotherapy in low risk grade one hypertension and in patients aged above 80 years or frail. Simply simplify regimen with one daily dosing and single pill combinations if these are available. Now we also split then the patients into black and non-black as you can see. Starting with the non-black patients, you should use um, a low dose of an ACE inhibitor or an ARP, an AT1 receptor antagonist, or, and you should add a a dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker to this. So a combination, low dose, RAS inhibitor, and dihydropyridine calcium blocking agent. Now, the second step is then to increase this to full dose. If that doesn't work to control blood pressure, add a thiazide or thiazide-like diuretic. If this is not enough, now we are in the area of resistant hypertension, add spironolactone, or if not tolerated, or contraindicated amylaride, doxazosine, eplerinone, clonidine, or a beta blocker. You see the beta blocker comes very late and is only in the fourth row, so to speak. Well, just a word to the uh, ACE inhibitors and the ARPs. In women with or planning pregnancy, they should not be used because they can damage the fetus. In black patients, it's slightly different. You would start with a low dose of an ARP, not with an ACE inhibitor, because uh, angioedema is more often seen with ACE inhibitors than with ARPs in black patients, especially. You add a dihydropyridine calcium blocking agent as in the non-black patients, or you can start with a dihydropyridine calcium channel blocking agent plus a thiazide or thiazide-like diuretic. You have the chance, you have the choice. The second is then again to increase to full dose. And then at the first, in the first step, you add a diuretic or an ARP or an ACE inhibitor. If you end up in resistant hypertension and blood pressure is still not controlled, you have to add spironolactone and all the others as already mentioned. Then we come to monitoring. The target in the essential area is always to reduce blood pressure by at least 20 over 10 millimeters of mercury. If you can do nothing else, reduce it by over 20 over 10. Ideally, of course, below 140 over 90 millimeters of mercury. Individualize for elderly based on frailty who may have to be very careful with blood pressure lowering in frail elderly patients. Monitor is of course blood pressure control and you have to try to achieve the target within three months 
You have to look for adverse effects of the drugs, of course, and the long-term adherence. And if there are further problems and blood pressure is still uncontrolled or other issues, then refer to care provider with hypertension expertise. So this is uh, basically hypertension management at a glass in the essential conditions. Now we come to the blue ones, to the optimal ones, and you see there is already quite a difference in the beginning. Office blood pressure meant, yes, you start with that also. You do three readings and you use the average of the second and the third. Now we have only two groups. The one is if blood pressure is below 130 over 85 millimeters of mercury, you remeasure after three years. Of course, one year in those with other risk factors. If blood pressure is above 130 over 85, you want to confirm this with home or ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. If their home blood pressure is below 135 over 85, of 24 hours ambulatory blood pressure measuring is below 130 over 80, then you have to, let me just see, you have to remeasure after one year. If home blood pressure is above or equals 135.85, or 24 hour ambulatory blood pressure is above or equals 130 over 80, millimeters of mercury, then you have a clear hypertension diagnosis. You see that it's a bit more dependent here on ambulatory and on home blood pressure measurement because under these settings, these are available, we assume. The evaluation then is very similar to the one we have already seen in the essential conditions. Of course, history and physical exam and so on. What comes to that, you have to assess total cardiovascular risk. You can do that under these conditions. You have to check adherence right away. So you have more possibilities. You can do a little bit more in the evaluation. Now the lab tests are, ex uh, are exactly the same uh, that you have already seen. Um, the lab tests with serum and sodium and so on, that is not different from the essential conditions. Additional tests also not different if necessary for suspected organ damage or secondary hypertension. So that is very similar under both, both conditions. Differences again in the treatment area. Grade one hypertension, again, above 140, 159, 90, 95 millimeters of mercury, you start lifestyle interventions as always, and you start drug treatment immediately in high-risk patients with cardiovascular disease, chronic kidney disease, diabetes, or organ damage. Immediate drug, and this is actually quite a majority of the elderly patients. After three to six months of lifestyle intervention in low to moderate risk patients, with persistent blood pressure elevation, you also start now with the drug treatment. In grade two, of course, the same. You always have to start with the drugs immediately. And also this is accompanied by lifestyle interventions. The lifestyle interventions are similar to the ones in the essential area. What you should do in addition to that, you have to lower stress if possible, and you have to reduce exposure to air pollution if this is at all possible. Drug therapy steps simplify regimen with once daily dosing and single pill combinations. We assume that under optimal conditions, single pill combinations that can be given once daily are available. Consider monotherapy in low risk grade one hypertension only in those and in patients aged above 80 years or frail only in those patients. Otherwise, always start with a single pill combination right away. Again, the differentiation between non-black patients and black patients. In non-black patients, low dose ACE inhibitor or ARP plus CCB, increase to full dose, add the thiazide like diuretic, add spironolactone and so on if you cannot control with three drugs, including a diuretic. In black patients, again, start with an ARP, not with an ACE inhibitor, because, as I mentioned, more angioedema in black patients with ACEs, plus a dihydropyridine calcium blocker, or 
start with the dihydropyridine calcium blocker plus a thiazide like diuretic. Increase the full dose and then add a diuretic or an ACE or an ARP. Add spironolactone if blood pressure is not controlled as in the uh, green area. Monitoring is very similar again. You want target the blood pressure below 130 over 80. That is relatively new and also consistent with the European and the American guidelines. So still, we define blood pressure, uh, high blood pressure, hypertension as above 140 over 90 millimeters of mercury. But the target of treatment, if at all possible under optimal conditions, should be below 130 over 80 millimeters of mercury. And of course, individualized for elderly based on frailty. Monitor blood pressure, of course, blood pressure control, and that should be done not only with office measurements, but also with home blood measurements, plus, uh, if possible, a BPM. And of course, check the long-term adherence. Referral is the same as under essential conditions. If blood pressure is still uncontrolled, or is there another issue, refer to care providers with hypertension expertise. So you see there are similarities and dissimilarities between the two. We try to make it relatively simple, especially for those patients that have to be treated under non-optimal conditions in areas which are not so affluent. And of course, then in all those affluent countries, the therapy regimens are very similar, of course, to the ones which have already been published in the European and the American Japanese and other guidelines. That brings me to the end. Um, I hope you have learned something uh, from our guidelines and I hope you will also uh, contribute to our next webinar in uh, two weeks when questions will be answered by the experts who contributed to these guidelines. Thank you very much.